Now tonight, the 12th chapter of Matthew. Matthew, the 12th chapter. These words, I've preached three separate sermons from this text during this past week, and I want to preach another one tonight. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given you but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Of course, Jesus was talking about his resurrection. He was rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees. They were wanting a sign. Jesus said, I am the sign, and my death and burial and resurrection will be a sign in every generation that God loves the world and was willing to give his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it's interesting to me that Jesus picked one of the most incredible stories in all the Bible to use as an illustration. We've all heard jokes about Jonah and the whale. We've heard professors of science that made fun of it. They said there couldn't be a whale that could swallow a man, and a man lived three days and three nights in a whale's belly. But the Bible says it happened, and Jesus said it happened, and now some scientists are saying that it is possible to happen. Now, the Bible doesn't really say it was a whale. You go back to the book of Jonah, about the middle of the Bible, a little book of four chapters. You can read it in five minutes. One of the most dramatic and thrilling stories in all the Bible. It says that God prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. In other words, he was custom made by God for the occasion. God prepared a great fish. We know that they found whales that are 70 feet long. We don't know what kind of fish it was, but God prepared it, and the whole thing is a miracle from top to bottom anyway. In fact, the little book of Jonah is a book of miracles. It's filled with miracles. The wind that came up, the fish that was prepared, the gourd that grew, but the greatest miracle of all was the greatest revival in the history of the world when one of the greatest cities of all of world history turned from the king on down to God in repentance of sin and faith in God. Now, before that happened, though, God had called Jonah. God said, Jonah, I want you to go and warn the people of Nineveh to repent of their sins because judgment is coming. Now, the Scripture says, and Jonah said, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. Did you know that that expression or a similar expression is found over 2,000 times in the Old Testament? I believe the word of the Lord did come to them. I don't believe they'd tell 2,000 lies in the Old Testament. I believe that this book, the Bible, is inspired of God. It's God's book. It's God's message to every generation. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And God's word said, Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. Cry out against Nineveh, for their wickedness has come up before me. There comes a time when God can stand sin and wickedness no more. And judgment must come. That's the danger in America right now. That's the danger in the world right now. Our wickedness is so great that God may allow judgment to fall unless we as a people turn back to God. And that's one of the encouraging things about this youth revival across America. Thank God that the young people are beginning to turn to Christ in great numbers. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. But you know, Jonah wasn't happy about it. He didn't want to be a fire and brimstone preacher in Nineveh. There was no glamour in that. He knew he would be persecuted. 
He knew he wouldn't be popular. He didn't want to have to give a message of judgment to Nineveh. So Jonah decided that he was going to flee. He was going to get away. He was going to disobey God. And the Bible says that Jonah fled from the presence of the law. And he went down to Joppa and he bought a ticket for Tarshish because you see, Tarshish was a great resort city. And he thought to himself, I can go down there and lie on a beach and the Lord won't even know where I am. I can get away from it all. And that's been true all the way through the Bible. Adam and Eve thought they could get away from God and hide in the garden and hide behind the fig leaves that they sowed after they rebelled against God. But God came walking in the garden and said, Adam, where art thou? The Bible says you can make your bed in hell and you can't get away from God. There's nowhere for you to flee from God. And then the Bible says that he went down to Joppa, got into the ship and went down into the bottom of the ship to go asleep. Sin always leads us down. Jonah went down. And when you sin and persist in sin, it's going to lead you down. Jonah was on the road down. He was disobeying God. He was rebelling against the word of the Lord. And he went down, down. That tragedy in your life, that problem in your life, that disappointment that broke your heart, you thought it was a tragedy. You thought it was by accident. It might have been sent by God. Because you see, your body is not so important as your soul or your spirit. Your body is temporary. It's going to go to the grave, but your soul, your spirit will live on forever. And God is interested in saving your spirit. And sometimes he allows your body to suffer in order to bring your spirit to himself. Jonah paid the fare thereof. Jonah said, well, it's nobody else's business. If you go out and shoot heroin, you say, that's nobody's business but mine. Yes, it is. What about your parents? What about that unborn child you may have? What about the other people that you have hurt that are brokenhearted because of your selfishness and your greed and your desire for escape? You say, if I have sex relations, that's nobody's business but mine. What about the girl that you hurt? What about the guilt that you'll carry? What about the possibility of VD that does not respond to any penicillin today? What about the illegitimate child that may be born? You hurt many other people when you commit sin. You don't sin alone. The Bible teaches you don't. Even marijuana. 39% of American young people, they say, are now smoking pot. You say, well, Billy, it's no more than smoking a cigarette and no more than taking a drink. But you know what they're beginning to find out now? And I've got all kinds of statements by some of the most famous scientists. Dr. Peterson spoke to the students of the University of Winnipeg the other day, and he said, my research is convincing me that marijuana will produce extensive brain damage. And then he predicts that 10 years from now, the majority of hospitals in America are likely to be filled with people who used marijuana 10 years earlier. Even Jane Fonda, you know Jane Fonda. You know what she stands for and believes in. She even said, people think I'm way out. They're wrong. I used to be pro-marijuana, but I'm against it now, she said. You say it's your business? It's everybody's business. It hurts many people when you take drugs or premarital sex or any of these other things. Jonah said, I'll go where I want to go and live the way I want to live. That's right, Jonah. You've got that privilege if you're ready to pay the price. But I want to tell you the price is tremendous. And then the Bible says that Jonah went to sleep in the boat. Sin is like that. Sin is a sedative. You know, sin is at first exciting. 
then it's boring. Then after a while, you lose your conscience and sensitivity to sin, and your conscience becomes dead. And what a terrible thing it is when your conscience is dead. How many of you, when you used to hear the gospel years ago, tears would come to your eyes? Or it made you uncomfortable? Or it pricked your conscience? Now you can listen to the gospel preached and it doesn't even bother you. You can just turn it off. When that happens, you're in a dangerous position because God said concerning Ephraim, Ephraim is joined to his idols, let him alone. Wouldn't it be awful if God would say, leave him alone? Don't convict him. Don't speak to him anymore. Let him go. He's only got another 10 years to live or 20 years to live. Let him go. Three times in the first chapter of Romans, God says, I give them up. I give them up. I give them up. There is a sleep, the Bible says, unto death. A spiritual sleep that is produced by prolonged practicing of sin that deadens the conscience, hardens the conscience. And then the Bible says, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. You know, there are not many places in the Bible where it says God gave a man a second chance like he did Jonah. But God gave Jonah a second chance. The Bible warns, my spirit will not always strive with a man. The Bible warns, he that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. But God gave Jonah a second chance. Do you remember when God spoke to you the first time? It might have been at your mother's knee. It might have been through a gospel broadcast that you heard. It might, might have been through a Bible that you found in a hotel room. I don't know where it was or how, but God spoke to you the first time. And you almost responded, but you didn't do it. Backward, oh, backward, oh, time in its flight. And make me a child again just for tonight. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could turn the clock back and go back to those moments that we turned God down when we had a chance? Tonight, God has allowed you to come to this stadium. And this is an hour that God is giving you another chance another moment to make your commitment to him the thief on the cross was dying and he turned to jesus at that dying moment he was a murderer he was a thief he deserved to die and he said lord remember me he took his one and only chance and at that moment jesus said today thou shalt be with me in paradise he didn't have time to even be baptized he didn't have time to straighten up his life. He came just as he was, hanging there naked, guilty of murder, guilty of robbery, guilty of everything. And all he said was, Lord, remember me. All you have to say tonight is, Lord, remember me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, the Bible says. Well, Jonah didn't have to hear it a third time. Because the Bible says Jonah began to pray down in the belly of the fish. And what a prayer meeting that was. I want to tell you, in a few minutes, he graduated from Fish University. It says the fish spit him up. And he went out on the beach. And he started toward Nineveh, where God had told him to go into the beginning. And you know, the Bible says that Nineveh takes three days to get there. But Jonah made it in one day. Now, he must have been really breaking the speed limit. He was obeying God so fast. He had had his experience on the ocean. He had had his experience in judgment. Now, from this moment on, he was going to be an obedient servant of the law. And he went to Nineveh. And the Bible says he began to shout up and down the streets, Repent, Nineveh! Judgment is coming! Repent! Repent! And one of the greatest and strangest and most thrilling events of all recorded history happened. 
the king, think of it now, the king of the whole nation sat down in sackcloth and in ashes and called the people to fast, told them to turn from their evil ways. He said, don't even let the animals drink or eat. Let's show God we mean business. And a great and mighty metropolitan area, as big as some of our modern cities, repented. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says God repented. When God saw their repentance, God changed his mind. He deferred judgment. The judgment was about to fall. They repented. And there's one thing God cannot do, and that's judge a man that's repenting or a man that's in Jesus Christ. Because you see, the word repentance means change. Change the direction of your life. Change the pattern of your living. Change everything in your life. Because you see, Jesus Christ is a disturber. He comes in to disturb. You can't be the same again when you've met Jesus. You're different. Old things pass away and everything becomes new, the Bible says, when you come to Christ. That's the reason Jesus Christ said, you better sit down and count the cost before you come to me. You can't just come up to me and say, here I am, Lord. You're lucky to get me. You've got to come in repentance. You've got to say, Lord, I've sinned. I've disobeyed you. I've rebelled against you. Lord, I come by faith to receive your son, Jesus Christ, into my heart. And all of Nineveh repented and turned to God, and they never faced judgment in that generation. Now, if you go to the book of Nahum, the next book over, you'll find about a hundred years later they'd forgotten the revival, forgotten their repentance, and the judgment of God did fall, and it was so great. The judgment was so great on Nineveh a hundred years later that archaeologists couldn't even find it till not long ago. God absolutely wiped it out because Nineveh had one time repented and then they had repented of their repentance. Their children had. There was a time when we had a generation of godly people in America. But the children and the grandchildren have gone their own way. And in Nineveh's day, they couldn't even find the city when God got through with them. He allowed the Babylonians to come in and destroy the city as no city in history has ever been destroyed as a judgment. Do you think God's changed? Do you think God says, okay, Dallas and Fort Worth, you're my pets. Do you think God is saying to the American people, Americans, you're my pets, you're my favorites. I'm going to spare you. Now, the rest of the world's got to be judged, but I'm going to spare you because you've got on your coins and God, we trust. If the Supreme Court doesn't get it off before we get through preaching. But I think, but I think that I see signs in the mulberry bushes now. I think I hear the blowing of a breeze in America. I think American young people are beginning to say, we want something more than materialism. We want something more than sex and drugs. We want God. And so we're beginning to read stories of young people turning by the thousands to Jesus Christ. Have you found Christ? Does he live in your heart? You say, well, Billy, how do you find Christ? You know, Campus Crusade for Christ is going to come to Dallas in the Cotton Bowl next year in June called Explo 72. And they're going to bring together, we hope, 100,000 students and all kinds of people to study the scriptures and sing together and pray together. And they have what is called the four spiritual laws. The first one is God loves you and God has a plan for your life. How true that is. God loves you. I don't care what sin you've committed. 
It doesn't make any difference how far you tried to run from God. He loves you. His eye is on you. He sees you. He sees you in that tenement house in New York. He sees you in that bar in Los Angeles. He sees that you're trying to run and flee. But he loves you. And he has a plan for your life if you'll only turn and repent. And maybe God has allowed this emptiness and this disillusionment and these problems to come on you to try to get you to turn. And then the second one is that you're a sinner. You have to admit it and confess it and acknowledge it and say, Lord, I've sinned and I'm sorry for my sin and I'm willing to turn from my sin. And then you must receive Jesus Christ by faith. It is an act of faith. You cannot come to Christ the intellectual route alone. You have to come with your intellect. You have to come with your emotions. You have to come with your will, your total personality, your total person must come to Christ and receive him as your Lord and your Savior and your Master. You see, he died on the cross for you. He died in your place. And God is saying through that death, I love you. I'm providing a sacrifice for you. I am providing an atonement for your sins. Christ shed his blood on that cross for a purpose. That blood became the cleansing fount where all of us can find a place to wash our sins away. Of course, the blood is symbolic of life, the life that was given for you. Now you must receive by faith God's offer of mercy and pardon and forgiveness. And then you must be willing to obey Him. That means to go back to your school and back to your business and back to your labor union and back to your farm and back to your friends and take your stand for Jesus Christ no matter what the cost. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to do that tonight. During these past few days, we have seen thousands of people come out on this turf to say yes to Christ. And I'm going to ask you to do it tonight. I'm going to ask hundreds and even thousands of you to get up out of your seat right now and say tonight, I want Christ in my heart. And I'm going to ask you to come and stand in front of this platform. And as you stand there, when you all come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature, a counselor will say a word to you, then you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends or relatives or come in a bus, they'll wait on you. There's plenty of time. And I'm going to ask that people not to leave the stadium. I know the temptation will be to leave. But this is a holy moment. And I'm going to ask those of you that God is speaking to now to come. Some of you have been running from God a long time. You may be Catholic. You may be Protestant. You may be Jewish. You may not have any religious background at all. Or you may be the deacon of the Baptist church. I don't know who you are. But you need Christ. You need repentance. You need a change in your life. I'm going to ask you to get up and come right now with these many that have come during the past few weeks. You may be in the choir. You get up and come. Why do I ask you to come? Every person that Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. There's a reason. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. You get up and come right now. The choir is going to sing as you come quickly, hundreds of you from all over, and stand here in front quietly and reverently.
As you that are watching by television can see, hundreds of people are coming from every part of this great Texas stadium to say yes to Jesus Christ. You could make that same commitment right now in your home or wherever you happen to be watching. You can say, yes, Lord Jesus, I want to receive you into my heart and he will receive you. May God help you to make that commitment and plan to go to church next Sunday. God bless you and good evening.